step out of the grave Break into the spirit
Jesus, let this not just be words tonight. We humbly and willingly lay down our wills before you. We say, Lord, have your way. We are your bond slaves, Lord. Whatever you say, Lord, whatever it is, whatever the cost, whatever the price, we say yes, Lord. We say yes, Lord. Oh, we say yes, Lord. Oh, we say yes, Lord. Oh, I 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 say yes, Lord.
Jesus. Jesus, we love you, Lord.
so sweet Only you Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're the source of holiness. You're the source of righteousness, the source of life, the source of salvation, the source of deliverance. You're the source of peace. You're the source of our eternity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you. Praise you. Praise you, Lord. Glory and honor to your holy name. Thank you, thank you. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to your name. Glory and honor to you. Praise you, praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. I worship you. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory, glory to you, Jesus. There's no one else like you. No one. 
no one else like you. Father, your word says that the day is coming when we're going to experience the second greatest change in our lives, that being the glorification of our bodies. The Bible says that when Jesus returns, that we will be like him, and we're going to see him as he is. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. The glory within us is going to be released upon these mortal bodies, and the mortal shall be made immortal. Praise you, Lord. Between now and then, my prayer is that we will continue to press toward the mark that you set before us, conforming fully to the image of Jesus Christ. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being with those who are watching, wherever they are. Your will be done, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Okay. There's an empty hand in here somewhere. You need to find it and fill it with yarn. Praise the Lord. Good to see you guys tonight. Those of you that are watching, by faith I see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for, for watching. This coming Saturday, oh, let me tell you, big day. This coming Saturday is going to be the great day of debushing. <laughs> and we are going to de-shrub the east side of the building. And then the ones in the front are going to get a haircut. And I'm, they're starting to look like hippie shrubs. They are going to get a haircut. And they're going to look really good when we're done. So anyway, uh, and what time is it? They're supposed to show? Between 8.30 and 9. 8.30 and 9 uh, this coming, that's in the morning. Between 8.30 and 9 Saturday morning, okay? And the more people that show up, the quicker we'll get this done. So thank you guys ahead of time for all your help. Please turn over to Luke chapter 18 going to look at a passage of scripture that I and others have taught on in the past. I, it's been a while since I've taught on this. But we're going to look at it from just a slightly different angle. And then I'm going to bring something else out to you related uh, to what we're going to see here. One of the things that brings about a tremendous challenge for Christians when it comes to understanding the Bible is a lack of understanding of who they are and who God is. And really, that leads to knowing what God's goals are. Well, here in Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, Jesus is teaching. It says, He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought to always to pray and not to faint. And what's interesting is that that phrase, not to faint, Part of it means don't become desperate. Don't become desperate. And so here he begins teaching. He says, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded or respected man. And there was a widow in that city. She came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. In other words, this woman just will not let up. She won't leave me alone. And it, it says that he would not help her for a while. But she just kept on and kept on and kept on and kept on and finally said, I can't take this anymore. I'm going to do what this lady wants. She's the squeaky wheel. I'm going to give her the oil and I am going to be rid of this. And the Lord said, verse 6, hear what the unjust judge saith. That word unjust, it comes from a Greek word. Part of its meaning is a steward of unrighteousness. 
For he says, hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Now, I don't know how you've heard this taught in the past. But a long time ago, I would hear people teach this. And what they would do is take a look at what the unjust judge did. And say, okay, now, look in verse 7. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? And they would say, we have to be like that widow woman. We have to go to God and we have to keep, you know, pounding on the doors of heaven. We've got to keep praying and keep praying and keep praying and keep praying and keep praying because sooner or later, God's going to help you out. <laughs> now, let's take a look here. First off, this woman is a widow. And then she goes to a judge and the judge is what we refer to as the unjust judge. That's what Jesus calls him. So the woman is a widow. And she ha she's having a problem with somebody. We don't know what that problem is, but apparently it's not good. And she has what she sees as no other recourse. She doesn't have a husband she can go to and say, you know, go beat this guy up. No, there's nothing she can do. So she does what she believes is the only way to get help. She goes to this judge. Now, tonight, look at it from this perspective. She goes to the world to get help. And she can't find it. I mean, but she just keeps nagging and nagging and nagging until finally this judge says, you know, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. I'm just going to give her what she wants and just get her out of here. But to compare God to that judge would be calling God an unjust God. A steward of unrighteousness. Well, he can't be a steward of unrighteousness. He's righteous. And Jesus, it almost sounds like in verse 7, though, he's telling you, compare God to the unjust judge. And God is like that. Because his own elect are going to, you're supposed to cry day and night unto him. And he's going to bear long with you. He's going to endure it. He'll put up with it. But eventually, you'll wear him down. Well, now, let's think about this. If that's true, if it's true that we, the elect, are supposed to fuss and fuss and fuss and just, oh God, where are you? Oh God, help me, help me, help me, avenge me of my adversary. Oh God, oh God. And that finally, after he has bared long enough with us, he's going to answer? If that's true, then why in the world did Jesus say in verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. That phrase, that word speedily, it means he acts. Now, it, this verse 7 is really kind of King Jamesy. But Jesus gives this explanation about this widow. He says this widow had nobody else to go to. Because she's a widow. So she goes to the world, the judge, to try to find help. And the judge doesn't act. And then Jesus says in verse 6, you know, finally, well, he leads up to it and says, you know, finally after, you know, uh, this goes on and on, finally the, the unjust judge gives her, now listen, he gives her what she wants because she's irritating him. <laughs> All right? So then, if we carry that over, it means that God will do what we want him to do because we're irritating him. 
I don't see that in Scripture. Well, this verse 7, it says, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Now, let me rephrase this for the sake of this teaching, okay? He says, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And do you think that God will avenge his own elect simply because they cry out to him day and night over and over and over until he can bear no longer with them? No. I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Now nobody, how, the way he opened this in, verse, in chapter 18, uh, verse 1, where he says, always to pray and not faint, and knowing that that phrase, not faint, comes from a, a, a Greek word that means become desperate. Well, we see desperation in the, the action or um, the interaction between the widow and the, the unjust judge. We see desperation on her part. And so Jesus is saying, do you think that God responds only because you're desperate? No, I'm saying, Jesus, he's saying, pray. Yeah, you should always pray, but don't be desperate in your prayers. Because as God's elect, I tell you, he will avenge you speedily. But then notice what he says next. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, Shall he find faith on the earth? Now, the Son of Man was already there, right? So obviously he's not talking about now that I'm here, when I cometh, shall I find faith on the earth? He's talking future tense here. Okay, now, now look at this. He starts out and he says, yes, you should always pray, but don't become desperate. And when I come, will I find faith on the earth? In other words, when I come, am I going to find you living by what I'm saying to where you're believing God as his elect, you're believing him, and you're praying in faith, believing him that he is hearing you and he is going to avenge you speedily or are you going to become desperate in your prayers and act like this widow woman and just keep pounding on heaven's gates? Oh God, oh God, why aren't you there? Why aren't you helping? Why aren't you, where are you? And so on and so forth. But see, there's more to this that I want to share with you tonight. Notice it says, this was a widow and because she was a widow, she did not have a husband who would be there for her, who would be there to help her, to protect her, to, you know, whatever. She didn't have a husband. And so she didn't believe she had any other place or person to go to. But when Jesus makes this statement about a God avenging his own elect, He's looking beyond the cross to what he has completed here on earth. Now, from that perspective, here's in essence what he's saying, and I'm going to show it to you in another, in another passage. As God's elect, you are not going to be a widow. You are not going to be without someone. You are going to have a husband who will watch over you and protect you and come to your rescue and be there for you no matter what happens in any situation. Now, we may come back here to Luke 18, but turn over to Romans chapter 7 and you're going to see this. In Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. 
Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. See this? We're the elect of God, not because He's loved us better than anybody else and he's extended salvation to a select few. No, we're the elect because we made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And he's saying, you now are married to Jesus. You're married, you know, just to God. I mean, you, you have a husband. You are married to him who is raised from the dead. And now you have to keep in mind, he's using this as symbolism. So in that teaching about the unjust judge, he's saying this widow had nobody because she was a widow. But you, on the other hand, you're no longer a widow. <laughs> you have a husband. You have somebody that you can go to. You don't have to keep crying out to the world for help. You have a husband, and he's more than a mortal husband. He is the King of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. He is the risen Savior. He is symbolically your husband, and he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So when you run into problems and you run into situations, you can go to him, and you can let him know, you know avenge me of my adversary. And he steps in between you and your adversary to avenge you speedily and bring a resolution to the problem. And what's the Bible say over there in, in uh, uh, Peter? It says, your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may, he may devour. So regardless of how you want to use that word adversary relative to the problems that you're facing, we have a husband who's there for us, glory to God. Now I know, you know, some people get caught up in this, well, I'm a man, you know, I, I'm not into that, you know, being married to another man thing. No, the symbolism. He's wanting you to understand that the sanctity of marriage here on earth represents the sanctity of our relationship with him. And he's not going to violate it, ever. But now notice this. He says that you'll be married uh, to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. See that? All right, now, the imagery here is Christ is the husband. That makes us what? The bride. All right? Male or female here on earth, the imagery is he's the husband, we're the bride. Now, notice it says that we're married to him so that we, we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now in the Old Testament, back in Proverbs, and I didn't write this verse down, it says that children are heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Okay? Now, how, how do you get children? Okay, we all know how. <laughs> okay, husband, wife, okay, husband, wife. Husband and the wife to whom he's married, not someone else's wife. Husband, wife. They interact in a marital fashion. The result, now listen to this, the result is the life in the husband is released 
into the womb of the wife, then she bears the fruit nine months later. See that? He says here, we have been married to Christ so that we should bring forth fruit unto God. The symbolism is that we're the bride, he's the husband. In spiritual intimacy, he releases his life into us as a seed. We then have a responsibility to spend time nurturing that seed. Follow this? And then symbolically now, nine months later, we bear the fruit of what was sown into us unto God. Praise the Lord. <laughs> now the imagery again is the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, etc., and so forth. Okay? So then the idea is we're going to have a whole lot of children. You get what I'm saying here? We're supposed to receive from our husband that, that flow of spiritual life so that we become the incubators, if you will, of what he wants accomplished here on earth. And we bear the fruit of that for him, for his glory. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Spiritually speaking, the fruit of my womb is to be his reward, is to bring glory unto him. And see, this was prophesied, I'll read this to you, it's prophesied in the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 54, verses 4 through 5. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. He prophesied this, this whole arrangement, thousands of years ago. I mean, as far as we're concerned today. And so now here we are. We have this responsibility. Well, Jesus said, when I come back, am I going to have faith? So the responsibility would be, okay, I believe you, and I'm not going to get desperate because I have a husband who's always there for me. He watches over me. He protects me. He provides for me. He never lets me down. And so I don't have to become desperate. I don't have to become like that widow woman dealing with the unjust judge of the world. No, <laughs> I'm no longer a widow. I am married to him who's risen from the dead. I have a husband who's going to be a steward of righteousness unto me. And therefore, yes, Jesus, I say, you're going to find faith as far as I'm concerned, because when I see what my husband has promised me here in the word, when I see this, I'm going to believe it. Because, well, you've given me your word. And as my husband, you're not supposed to lie to me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm your life, your, your wife, okay? I'm your spouse. You're not supposed to lie to me. You're supposed to be telling me the truth. So I'm just going to assume that everything you said in this book is true. And I'm going to act like it. And I'm going to believe it. And if you've told me that by your stripes I was healed, then you know what? I'm healed. I believe that I am healed. If you've told me that you're going to meet my needs, then you know what? I believe you're going to meet my need. You're not going to be a lazy, stay-at-home, couch potato husband. <laughs> You're going to be a loving husband. One who watches over me and takes care of me. You're going to be a good husband. And I'm not going to have to worry about anything. And I'm not going to have to be afraid that you're going to come home drunk some night and beat me up. No, it's not going to be like that. You're going to give me your peace you're going to give me your presence. You're going to give me glory. You're going to lift me up. You're going to do everything that I need. You're going to do it for me. Because I am my beloved's. 
And he is mine. His banner over me is love. I can depend on you. And therefore, you know, um, in, in um, what's a gentle way to put this? A lot of husbands complain, in the natural now, that marital activities are greatly lacking in their relationship. And one of the things the husbands are told is, well, if you treat your wife with love, then there may be a greater frequency of marital activities. I kept that pretty clean, didn't I? <laughs> oh, you out there got that little twinkle in your eye. Yeah, we know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, you know what? If, I, if I'm faithful to my husband, but I'm talking spiritually now, this imagery, but along with that, he will never mistreat me, which means I can trust him to be spiritually intimate with him because the only thing he's going to do is minister love to me. And it's out of that that I am going to be able to bring forth fruit unto God. Amen. Praise the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of liking this. <laughs> this is the God we serve. And see, throughout Scripture, he uses illustrations like this that we can relate to on an earthly level to try to get across to us how faithful he is. How that I'm not like this unjust judge. I'm not a steward of unrighteousness. No, I'll avenge you speedily. Now, that doesn't mean if somebody does you wrong, God's going to step in and just vaporize them with lightning bolts or something. No, there won't be fire from heaven. It's not like that. One of the ways that he will avenge you is to minister peace to you during an adverse circumstance. One of the ways that he's already avenged us would be by his stripes, you were healed. We are avenged of sickness and disease and injury. See this? So he, he, Jesus says, look, he will avenge you. Spiritually, he will step in and avenge you, whatever your adversary would be. We can trust him. All the time, every time, no matter what, we can trust him. However, if we don't get into the word, I mean, if we don't, every now and then, try to figure out what's in here, how are we going to know how we can trust him? And this is why you have a lot of Christians that want to say things like, well, you know, God broke my leg to teach me a lesson. You know, God gave me that sickness, laid me up in that hospital so I'd learn to trust him. No, I'm sorry. That's what an unjust judge would do. And I don't have an unjust judge. <laughs> I have a steward of righteousness, glory to God. <laughs> I am married to him who loves me, who will never fail me. And, you know, if my adversary does something and I don't know, my leg breaks. Guess what? By his stripes, I was healed. I can trust him for healing, no matter what. And you know what? The image this is presenting is one of, of unbelievable, incredible, the world can't understand it, trust. Trust in God. And I'll be the first to admit there are times when I realize I don't trust him as much as I should. Because every now and then I'll be talking to him, praying about something, and I can kind of feel, you know, that desperation <laughs> kind of, you know, working this way. And then I, oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. Don't mean to, don't mean to murmur. <laughs> I know what happens to murmurs. <laughs> okay, I'm not murmuring. Okay. <laughs> but I catch myself. And see, that's, that's a lack of trust. Well, see, that has to be fixed in, in, in me. And the more that I know him, the more that I, I trust him. And he's trying to get that across to us here in his word. And I want you guys, listen, I want all you guys be encouraged by this. We are married to somebody who's never going to cheat on us. We're, we're married to somebody, and I won't even get into the symbolism of what's written in scripture, but in here, in this book, 
He's made marriage vows. I will never leave thee and I will never forsake thee. I have forgiven you of all sin and your sins and iniquities while I remember no more. I mean, th- all these different kinds of things are like marriage vows that he's made unto us. Well, that'd be a sermon, wouldn't it? The marriage vows of God. Hey, I thought of it first. All right, don't. <laughs> this book's full of those marriage vows that he is never going to break. Glory to God. I can trust him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Go ahead and stand. Thank you, Jesus. I am a widow no more. Praise the Lord. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, for these promises. I need to know them, understand them, and believe them better than than what I ever have before. And I, Father, I feel like I speak for a lot of us here. But I thank you for this. And I thank you, Father, that repeatedly in your word you present this imagery to try to get across to us who you are to us and who we are in you. I'm so glad I'm born again, Father. I'm so glad I'm not living the way that I used to live. I'm so glad that you are everything to me. Father, like a, a song in the past that talks about though everybody else forsakes us, you will not. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise your holy name. You are good. You're wonderful. And I I can trust you. Just like David wrote, I can lay down in bed at night and I can go to sleep because you will sustain me. Praise you, Jesus. I love you. I love you. And I just pray, Father, that we come to an increasing revelation and understanding of these truths. You are so good to us. I love you. I worship you. Praise you, Father, for the power of your word and how transforming it is. Bless your holy name. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Glory and honor to you, Savior. I worship you. I worship you. Every single one of you in here and every one of you watching, you have a call of God upon your life. I don't know what it is for each one of you. But one of the worst things you could do is to look at me and think of me as having a greater calling than you. My calling is no greater than yours. No greater. But what happens is, oftentimes we we look at the pastor, we look at the people in the pulpit, and we esteem them to be of greater importance to God but we're not we're simply acting in what God has called us to do and every single one of you you have a calling that is just as critical and important to this world as the one on me or anybody else that you listen to so I want you to be encouraged with that and I want you to think about it don't dismiss it talk to God about what he has called you to do. Praise the Lord. Well, guys, listen. Um, Yeah, the sermon was a little short tonight, but that's okay. (laughs) I I know uh, one fellow once said, a sermon does not have to be eternal to be immortal. (laughs) (laughs) Amen to that one. (laughs) Praise God. All right, listen, if you have an offering uh, tonight, go ahead and bring it up before you head home and Uh, As you leave tonight, just go in the grace and the peace of God, and uh, we'll see you again. Praise the Lord.